very, very excited about today's lab. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Arlene Vasquez. I am a matchmaker, dating coach, creator of Get Real, Get Love, and founder of AV Connections, a premier matchmaking service located in New Jersey, and we work with clients nationwide. So tonight, I have a very special guest for you, uh, and I hope that everyone will take advantage and ask as many questions as they have about plastic surgery, because we have a wonderful, wonderful plastic surgeon here who is top notch. Uh, just to give you a little information about Dr. Abramson, uh, let me find my glasses so I can read this carefully. Uh, just a little information here. Um, Dr. Abramson has published 30 articles and book chapters on various topics in plastic reconstructive surgery. Uh, he is has become very popular as a guest lecturer in hospitals and residency programs on current trends in plastic and reconstructive surgery. He is honored to have held the, distinct, the distinction of being the program director of the oldest plastic surgery residency in the United States established in 1947. And Dr. Abramson is, is an innovator, has described new techniques for facelift abdominal plasty, this is gonna be fun tonight, breast reduction and breast reconstruction. He is currently the president of the New York Regional Society of Plastic Surgeons and president-elect of the New Jersey Society of Plastic Surgery. Recently, Dr. Abramson was named acting associate chief of surgery services at Englewood Hospital in Medical and Medical Center. And I know that you also have offices in Manhattan, in Englewood and Franklin Lakes. Anything that I missed? <laughs> no, I think that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Glad to be here. Well, I'm very excited that you're here because, of course, anytime that I do a blab, it's all about what I'm interested in. Uh, and so I have lots and lots of questions, and hopefully we'll have quite a few people join us and ask uh, some questions. Uh, and, and in any case, anyone who's here, please post your questions over on the side, on the right-hand side where it says send a message in the chat box and we will tr do our best to get to everyone's questions. And then of course, at the end of the blab, I will give you information for, uh, if you wanna reach out directly to Dr. A uh, Dr. Abramson or you can send the questions to us at AB Connections and we will go ahead and forward the, the information. But um, I have a, a question for you. Um, I hear this thing called the mommy makeover a lot, and I'm, I'm curious, um, you know, what is that? What does that entail? Like, what are the things that you do in a procedure like that? Well, it can really depend on what the patient needs, because after having one, two, three, or more children, different women have different things that have changed about their body. Most commonly is an abdominoplasty because the muscles get stretched, there's extra skin, we need to remove some fat. And then the question is, what does that get combined with? So some people, it gets combined with a breast lift if they have adequate volume. With other people, it could be a breast reduction, it could be a breast augmentation, or sometimes it's a combination of an augmentation and a breast lift if the person needs volume and they have sagging skin and sagging breasts after maybe breastfeeding a couple of children. Also, some people add a little liposuction of other areas, maybe the back, the flanks, the um, thighs. It really depends. You kind of tailor it. It's a catch-all phrase, but there are a lot of variations based on the individual. Now, I'm curious, with a mommy makeover, is this something that you do in one at one time, like one surgery, you're kind of out the whole time and get all this work done. Is that how that works? Well, I, I think that you have to be careful in how much surgery you do at a given setting. Um, there are recommendations to not do more than six hours of surgery at a time. So depending on what needs to be done, many things can be done at the same time, but you, you can certainly do an abdominoplasty, an augmentation, a mastopexy or breast lift all at the same time and maybe throw in one other small procedure but you always have to manage how long the patient's on the operating room table, what medical problems they may have, what potential blood loss or other uh, conditions they have into determining what can be safely done at one time. The more, you, more procedures you put together, the potential for complications or other problems does go up. So you have to weigh these issues and discuss them with the person. 
Yeah, and you know, it's it's interesting. I've seen a few shows, as you know, there's a bunch of shows out there, and I remember a while back seeing something about uh, a person not being able to have surgery if they're smokers. Is that true? Well, smoking does significantly increase the risk of complications, particularly wound healing. Okay. I mean, there are certainly plenty of people that have had surgery that smoke. It does increase the risk. We try and get everyone to stop. There are certain procedures that undoubtedly have a much higher risk of complications if they're smokers. Things like a facelift, an abdominoplasty in particular, would have a significant impact from of smoking on wound healing. And there's things that you have to weigh when deciding whether to operate on someone or not, or timing of the surgery. You know, if you stop smoking for a couple of weeks, and and the goal is not to have them go back and start smoking the day after surgery either, but um, you know. There are people that will actually check nicotine levels on smokers to make sure they've actually stopped smoking. Wow, <laughs> that's interesting. You know, so, like, if you if you were to wear a patch or something like that, that that doesn't help because it's still the nicotine. Right. You know, I guess it's kind of a trust and verify kind of situation. Right. <laughs> so, um, I'm curious. So, like, if you know, let's just say a mom, mommy makeover, just to kind of wrap up on that question. What is a, what's the price range for something like that where you're having all these multiple, um, particularly in the, you know, New York, New Jersey area, which we know is probably going to be a little bit more expensive than maybe the Midwest, I would imagine. Yes. And, and really the procedures do dictate the cost and there's multiple aspects to the cost. There's the cost of the surgical fee. There's the operating room. There's anesthesia. There's implants if necessary. So, you know, Costs can range, depending on how few procedures you do, could be maybe $10,000 all the way up to maybe twenty or $25,000 if you're doing a lot of procedures. So you really need to, uh, you have to come in, have a conversation. Um, my office manager, when I have a consultation, I lay out options for someone. Because sometimes they may have a wish list, but their wallet may not equal their wish list. And you have to prioritize what you can do, what bothers you the most, what you can afford. And then we work out a plan. And it's sometimes people wind up splitting things and doing it in two surgeries. But on other times, you know, you try and go ahead and do everything that you can at once. And there are patient financing companies such, um, such as um, Care Credit, Alfion Credit, and other, one, and other ones that and Prosper that all do help patients finance their surgery. Yeah, and you know, it's interesting as a matchmaker and dating coach, you know, people think, well, sometimes, you know, just plastic surgery is superficial and, and things like that. But really, um, it's kind of like sometimes it really helps you. It's a little bit of a makeover from the outside in. It really does so much for your, you know, state of mind. If it's something that's really troubling you and something you really want to get done and, and you have the ability to do it, I, it's just it's just a no brainer. You know, um, I, I haven't had any surgery yet, <laughs> but you and I are going to be having that conversation. And I'm curious, um, you know, I'm going to jump a little bit around, but when it comes to Botox, um, I notice sometimes when people use Botox, uh, and I know it's very popular now, even with men, not just women, but sometimes the women kind of have this weird look in their eyebrows and and I don't know, is, is there is there a good, you know, the right way to do it? Is there a timing for it? Uh, should you do it preventatively? And how do you avoid that kind of, you know, that look like a, it just, you know, doesn't look natural? Well, I think sometimes when people have Botox, they, the person doing it doesn't necessarily block the entire eyebrow. Now there's problems. You can overblock and give someone a, you know, expressionless look, which doesn't look good. But if you don't block a portion of the eyebrow, maybe the latter eyebrow will still be able to go up and the medial eyebrow won't. And then they kind of have that arched look that that's exactly it. we're trying to describe. So huh? I think you have to go to someone who has experience doing it. Um, I'm a big fan of going to board certified plastic surgeons for plastic surgery, um, you know, because you want someone who's been trained not only in how to do the surgery, but how to deal with the problems that you can encounter yeah. because as you, you know, if you operate enough, you will have complications and that, that is, is a fact. And you want someone who can actually take care of them. If you, otherwise you have to go to someone else, you know, it makes you wonder 
how qualified that person was to begin with in handling those issues. Yeah, no, I, I agree because I hear so many horror stories um, of people who want to save money and maybe go to, you know, different countries and they don't really, not that there aren't good, you know, doctors in various countries, but, you know, they don't really find out enough about these doctors and, and you know, it's crazy. And even in this country, there, there are um, other professionals, I guess, that are healthcare professionals that sort of do like weekend courses and all of a sudden they're, you know, doing certain procedures. And I would imagine that, you know, having an expert uh, plastic surgeon who's board certified makes a world of difference. <laughs> well, I mean, unfortunately, there's a lot of things that aren't well, well regulated. And one of the issues we've had in New Jersey is trying to require if you're going to do a procedure. They, right now, they require if you do a procedure under anesthesia, you have to have hospital privileges in that procedure to be able to do it which is great, except that now people have figured out how to do things without any, you know, anesthesia and doing them under local. So people are doing things in non-accredited operating rooms where it's basically like the wild west. You know, there's no training. There's nobody else there looking at whether you're the appropriate sterility and things like that are maintained in an operating room. And, and it's dangerous for people. And we do get cases that get emergence, emergently sent into the hospital with infections or blood loss or other problems on surgeries being done by people who aren't trained. And unfortunately, they're trying to make a buck because the rest of healthcare has become so difficult. But that doesn't, you know, a weekend course does not equal eight years of residency. So, you know, there is definitely a big difference. Absolutely. I just want to comment to the people that are here in the room. If you have any questions, by all means, type them up in the chat box there. Uh, in the meantime, I will keep uh, asking a couple of questions. Hi, Angela. Hi, Jim. And somebody else in there can't make out your your um, name. Um, so I wanted to ask, I hear this term all the time, the invasive, non-invasive. What's, what's the difference between these two things? Well, I, I think there's probably really three areas now. There's non-invasive, then I'd say there's minimally invasive, and then uh, uh, you know, invasive would be all-out surgery. Okay. Uh, non-invasive things can be, you know, I think this is where the minimally and non-invasive things get kind of blurred. Non-invasive things could be topical lasers, think or radio frequency, or fat freezing, like cool sculpting, or um, radio frequency like the Venus or Va Vanquish, those kind of things are non-invasive, um, but they do they do have a role. They all have a limited role. Then there's minimally invasive things, which would be, you know, maybe you want to fit into cellulase, smart lipo, things like that. Or even, I guess, injectables are kind of minimally invasive because you are actually going inside. So Botox, Juvederm, Restylane, uh, Voluma, you know, all those sorts of products would fall into the, you know, minimally invasive uh, product, minimally invasive type of criteria. Do you, um, do you turn away a lot of people yourself as a plastic surgeon? Well, you, I, I turn away people for a variety of reasons. The first would be that they have completely unrealistic expectations of what, where they are and where they think they're going to get to. The other thing is if someone's had many, many surgeries by many, many different people, that can be a red flag that they're never happy with what they're having done. Because there's, you'd ra I'd rather not do surgery than to have a deal with an unhappy patient. And if I can predict who the unhappy person is going to be ahead of time, that's a big save. And I do rely on my staff talking to people to say, you know what, I think you should stay away from this person because I don't think they're going to be happy or they're not going to be realistic. Right. It's interesting, um, you know, now plastic surgery and, and a lot of these cosmetic procedures have become very popular, I think, with men as well. And I know we have a couple of uh, maybe one or two men in the room. So I'm curious, what are the things that they're doing uh, for men these days that have become more and more popular? Well, I would say men for facial work, Botox is something men do. Um, eyelids are something uh, men take care of because, you know, those heavy hooded eyelids or bags under your eyes are something that, you know, 
a man may be in his 50s in the workforce, you want to look a little younger, you know, maintain your competitiveness, et cetera. So in terms of facial aging, that that's an area that men men deal with. In terms of the body, um, love handles that we call or the flanks are something that, you know, many men can't get rid of, you know, no matter whether they're thin or uh, work out. The other thing would be uh, gynecomastia is another area that men deal with a lot. And, uh, and that's frequently handled by liposuction, sometimes a combination of liposuction and excisional surgery, or I've actually uh, finished writing a paper on using liposuction and a cartilage abrader so that you don't have to put the scar around the nipple that was traditionally done. So those are things that men do. Um, obviously, men make up a much smaller percentage of the overall population. Having plastic surgery, I'd say it's in the 10 to 15 percent range. Interesting. Um, so speaking of, um, you know, the paper that you wrote, and I, I read something in your bio about facelifts. Is that is that one of your specialties that you, you know, I think you contributed something of a technique or something towards that? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, I do all plastic surgery. Um, I, you know, I do a fair number of uh, procedures for facial aging going from injectables all the way up to facelifts. And, you know, you really need to look at an individual and figure out what's going to be best for them. Um, some people mentally aren't ready for surgery, even though physically they'd be best served by that. Um, other people are looking for surgery and they're not ready for it. And you have to tell them that, you know, maybe we'll do a little injectables for now. You're really not ready. You know, you'll be ready for this in maybe three to five years, but we can do things to make you look better and make you feel better about yourself, you know, non-invasively or minimally invasively in the meantime. Yeah. And, and that's, you know, I, I love hearing that, you know, a doctor who has restraint too, because I know some people just kind of go overboard with the amount of surgery to the point where they, they just don't look right. And um, I mean, I don't know what happens to the person's brain, you know, <laughs> but I, I question sometimes like, what is the doctor thinking to continue to do these surgeries and procedures for people who really, you know, just don't even look like people anymore? <laughs> well, I mean, I think, you know, this is not something that is going to fix all the problems in someone's life. You know, it's something if you have a focused issue that we can make better. But if there's other things going on, those things also still need to be fixed. Having the plastic surgery is not going to, uh, you know, change your life trajectory on its own. It has to be part of a overall, you know, I have identified the various things that are bothering me in my life. And these are the steps I'm taking to fix them. And the fact that I don't like my stomach, my breasts, my eyes, my face, whatever, they all need to be, that can be addressed, but it's got to be part of, you know, an overall assessment of where you are. And then, and listen, and then there's other people that are perfectly happy with their life. They just have a, a thing that bothers them and they want that thing fixed. And, you know, obviously those people, you know, it's much more focused on what's going on. It all depends on what stage people are in their life and what else is going on, um, you know, in their life at the time. So is like liposuction popular anymore? I don't hear about it, you know, that much. No, it's still very popular. I mean, you know, it has a it has a role like everything else. I think some of the smaller liposuction procedures that may have been done are now being done with some of the non-invasive procedures. But even those non-invasive procedures, if you have to do them multiple times, the cost can actually wind up being more than the liposuction, and it takes longer. Uh, but liposuction is still probably one of the two most popular pr uh, procedures in plastic surgery based on statistics from the Plastic Surgery Society. Hmm. It's so it's so interesting how, <laughs> I mean, you know, for women in particular, like we're, we look in the mirror, we're like, oh my God, what is happening? You know, like you start to see all these little things and you're questioning like, okay, when should I do something about this? Like I noticed for myself, my my lips started to go downward and <laughs> Angela's like, yeah, I know. <laughs> And I'm like, when did my smile go down? So do I need something for that? Or this presentation right. here is just getting more and more. And I'm like, I have to go talk to Dr. Lee so about doing a couple of things here and there. You know, unfortunately or fortunately, gravity has its effect on all parts of the body. So, you know, what's going on in, that you're describing in your face, a lot of it is migration of fat inferiorly, you know, in your cheekbones, the fat used to be higher up when, you know, you'll probably look at a picture of you, you know, when you were 20, your cheekbones were higher, more prominent, and that fat's descended down. It creates the folds around here, you know, and we call these marionette lines. I mean, there's a lot of things that, that change over time. And, 
you can't really say an exact age when somebody, you know, needs something done because obviously people age differently. And some people will benefit from something at 35, where, where someone else may not need that till they're 50. So, you know, you really have to take stock of the individual, have a conversation with them, have them identify what is bothering them, and also have you be able to say, this is what I can do. Those two have to be lined up together. If the person wants something that's not fixable, or they want one thing, but you'd rather fix something else, that's not going to lead to a, a successful outcome. And I think that's where experience of what the surgery will achieve and also the experience of having to spoken to someone and spoken to many patients and figuring out what they want is the best way to achieve a happy patient, which makes for a happy surgeon too. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, Angela, if you want to come into our conversation, let me know. You, all you have to do is click on that um, on the seat there. It's an open seat. And we'll, and if you want to ask some questions, I'm looking down to see if she's interested. Um, so I definitely, my, my husband has a, his nose is a little bit twisted. And I don't know if he hurt himself or whatever, but he has a hard time breathing even, but it, he doesn't like the fact that it's a little bit twisted. Um, do you recommend that somebody go for surgery if they have a situation like that? Or I mean, like he just literally has a hard time breathing sometimes and he's got the crooked aspect as well. Well, there, there can be, you know, the, the issue with breathing is usually an internal issue and it can be related to the same problem that's causing the, the twisted or crooked that you're describing. It may have been trauma when he was younger. It could also have been something that was just congenital. And there are things you can do, whether it be removing the, you know, part, straightening the septum or removing what's called the turbinates, or sometimes you have to put cartilage grafts in to open up the airway. I mean, what has to happen is you have to take a look inside and, and determine what the problem is. And then you know what it is that you need to do to fix it. So sometimes you get a benefit cosmetically from fixing the breathing issue, but you know, otherwise, you know, you can do it just for the cos just for the cosmetic or just for the functional aspect of it. Yeah. So we we talk about that all the time. So you know, he and I may may have to make an appointment to come see you because <laughs> I'm like, well, you know, if you can't breathe, you might as well get that fixed and straighten out the nose while you're. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if I'll like him as much because you get used to seeing someone a certain way, which is kind of funny. Um. So so in terms of just getting back to the Botox, right? Because this is a question I always ask myself. Should somebody be doing it preventive? Uh, what's the word? Preventively? Or is this something where you just kind of, there's certain factors that, you know, you feel like, okay, it's time to do it. Like, how does one well, determine? I think there's, you know, usually people start to see some lines before they start to do Botox. Okay. Because you have to figure out what you're going to treat. There, I mean, there are probably people who want to prevent certain expressions that they may do too much. You know, certain frowning you can minimize by Botox. Those are the things that lead to the lines. But usually people start to identify lines. And, and I mean, that can be as early as, you know, early 30s where people start having Botox because, you know, you do start to get a little lines maybe in the crow's feet or maybe up between the eyebrows. And it's stuff that you can identify early and it's a pretty easy fix. It's just that, you know, you have to do it every three or four months to keep it up. Oh, okay. Yeah. Cause I'm debating if that's the route I want to take, I'm going to be 50 next year. So <laughs> something's going to happen, but I think it's going to be a mommy makeover. <laughs> <laughs> Even though my daughter's 27 now. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I think about these things all the time. I'm like, Hmm, is this something that I want to do? Um, how does a, a person then make the transition from Botox to a facelift? Like what's the determining factor for something well, like that? They really do different things. I mean, Botox is great for fine lines here and the forehead, but a facelift really is dealing with this whole middle of the face and the neck. So you're really doing different things and you have to, you know, once they get to the point where they start to identify other areas that are bothering them, that's when they have to talk about whether you can move to adding fillers or fat 
or you need to, to do a lift. I mean, you have to identify where the problems are, where the deficiencies are, and then look at the alternatives to try and fix them. Right, there's a question in the chat box here from Angela. And she's asking, should breast implants be under or over the muscle? Most breast implants are placed below the muscle. And there's a few reasons for that. With the silicone implants, most of them are placed below because there, there traditionally has been a, what's reported to as a lower incidence of capsular contracture. It's with the newer implants, that's relatively minor. The other aspect of it is it's easier to do mammography uh, when the breast implant is below the muscle. So, and also if people don't have much breast tissue, you'll see less rippling, whether even with a saline, with a saline or a silicone, you can see less rippling if it's below the muscle. So, you know, I would say certainly in the United States, the vast majority are done below the muscle. In Europe, it's different. Many of them are done above the muscle. I can't comment on, you know, the islands in South America, but it also depends on whether you're going saline or silicone and things like that. But most are done below the muscle. But again, you have to determine the person. If you have a person who's a bodybuilder and you put it below the muscle, they're going to animate those breast implants with their overdeveloped muscles and then they can move them when you see them. And that's not an attractive look either. <laughs> so you really have to kind of figure out the lifestyle of the person. I mean, there's a lot that you that goes into determining what you're going to do, I would imagine. Yeah, you have to have, have a conversation, see what they do, you know, and figure out what's best. But I would say most people, I mean, frequently at this point, I would say the ones that are above the muscle are usually requested. I want them above the muscle as opposed to doing them as a choice. And I think here's another question about um, how come some implants look stiff and not like not movable? Well, there can be a couple reasons. The first is if you have a breast implant that's too large, it won't look natural. The other aspect is if sometimes breast implants can develop what's called a capsular contracture, which is a hardening around the implant. There's always a capsule that the body forms a shell around the implant. And that shell that it creates can become thickened and then the implant kind of sticks in place. Um, there's a small percentage where that happens um, it probably that percentage does increase over time. Uh, much more common in reconstructive patients than cosmetic patients, but it is something that that has to be explained to the patient. There are a number of maneuvers that we do during the surgery to minimize that. We try not to let the implant touch the skin. Um, I use a, a funnel that, to put the implant in where the implant goes into the funnel. The funnel sticks into the into the pocket and instead of the old way of shoving it in with your fingers you squeeze the funnel it's kind of like a pastry bag in a way and it squeezes the implant in and then it doesn't touch the skin we also irrigate the pocket with antibiotics and we give the person preoperative antibiotics and these are things to try because there, it's thought that the, one of the uh, contributing factors to capsular contracture is um, low-grade bacteria in the area or blood. So you try and be very meticulous in terms of making sure there's no blood in the pocket and you want to be very meticulous in trying to make sure there's no contamination, which may not lead to an infection, but it may lead to this capsular contracture down the road. And the other question here is that um, what is the recovery time and, and possible complications, uh, you know, of breast implants? All right. I think recovery time, it depends on what you're trying to do. If you're trying to get back to work and you work in an office, you could probably go back to work in three, four days. If you're talking about going to the gym, I don't want people working out for three, three weeks because I don't want them raising their blood pressure up because if you get your blood pressure up, that can lead to some delayed bleeding. It's been reported up to 21 days. In wow. terms of upper body exercises, I don't want you using your pec for six weeks at a minimum. Um, in terms of in terms of uh, complications, bleeding, infection, an infection of an implant, although rare, could require the implant to be removed. So if you, you want to really make sure you don't have that problem, the other thing would be a bad scar or this capsular contracture. And implants are not lifetime devices. You know, if you're 25 years old and you have breast augmentation, you will have to replace them at some point. Um, there's recommendations of getting MRIs every few years and things like that to look at the implants, especially if they're silicone. And But those are all things you just have to be aware of that you may have to replace them at some point. 
So, and, and how often would you have them replaced? Like, what, every 10 years or something? Or You know, I usually tell people that you replace them when you have a problem. Um, if you evaluate the, the recommendation is an MRI after three years and then every couple of years after that. If you get an MRI and the implants are fine and the breasts are soft and they look good, I don't think you go in there because every time you go in, you do run risks of, you know, new complications. So if things are fine, I don't think you have to replace them at 10 years, but there obviously is an increased potential that that implant will fail if it's been in there 30 years versus being in five years. That's interesting. Um, and I think Angela was asking about uh, breast, can you do breast augmentation and liposuction at the same time, which I think you have sort of talked about with the mommy makeovers that you can. Yeah, you can you definitely do them at the same time. It's not a problem at all. So what are, what are your thoughts about these, um, oh gosh, what is the name of the, the butt implants or, you know, like this, this new thing now that everybody's getting. <laughs> oh, the Brazilian uh, butt lift? There we go, Brazilian butt lift. All right, I mean, it used to be that if someone wanted a bigger butt, you actually had to put a butt implant, butt buttock implant in, um, which was a solid silicone implant. And that solid silicone implant um, would usually put in through a little incision it, kind of at the upper portion of the crack uh, cleft of the, of the buttocks. Um, a few years ago, people started augmenting the buttocks with fat. So you do liposuction, you prepare the fat, you inject the fat. Not all that fat survives. So, you know, you do overcorrect a little bit. Um, sometimes if someone wants an exceptionally large buttocks, you need to augment them more than once. Um, you know, I, you know, I, it is definitely, an, I only have certain certain ethnicities that request that procedure. You know, <laughs> it, you know, you know, you get certain ethnicities that want that, and certain ethnicities that would be like, please let me have a smaller butt. So it's you know, but it is something that we do. Um, it is effective. People are usually happy. You have to remember your liposuction in the areas around it. So you're making those areas smaller, and then you're adding. So it's kind of like you make the mountain bigger. Also, if you make the valley lower, so it's a good combination. <laughs> This sounds like a song. <laughs> um, so when I just want to make sure if this, I'm not confused about some myths that I heard that when you get liposuction that, you know, you're moving fat from a certain area and that that means other areas of your body that kind of overcompensates and you get more fat there. Like how, what's the mechanism that happens in the body? Okay. What, what happens is with liposuction, you know, you, when you, when you reach a mature age, you have a certain number of fat cells and those stay the same. And if you gain weight, they tend to get larger, unless you become morbidly obese, you don't get more fat cells as an adult. So what happens is you have these X number of fat cells. If you remove the ones from the abdomen, say, and then you gain weight, there's less fat in the abdomen for those fat cells to get bigger so the other ones will get bigger but if you don't gain weight you won't get fatter in a different area okay all right that makes perfect sense i love the way that you explained it because <laughs> i i used to hear all these things all the time I'm like, i think i need some liposuction and then i would say well i don't want to you know make things worse <laughs> is there uh is there anything in particular that you you know, do the most of, like, for example, here, here's really my question. Like, um, when you go to a plastic surgeon, do they all kind of specialize in one particular area? Um, let's say somebody tends to do the, you know, noses, like nose jobs, the other one is more into breast augmentation. Like, how does that work? I mean, there are definitely some people that only do one or two procedures. I mean, I find it interesting to operate on all parts of the body, which is why I went into plastic surgery to begin with. Um, I think you want to make sure you uh, go to someone who does a reasonable number of a particular procedure. But I mean, there are certainly people who might do 20 nose uh, rhinoplasties a year that can do just as good a job as someone who does 50, you know, but on the other hand, if you're looking to have your nose done and a breast augmentation at the same time, it's, you know, you want to be able to go to someone who can do both and do them well, rather than have to you know, go to two people and have two surgeries at two different times and things like that. Right. That makes sense. And how do you determine, you know, what's a good person to, to see, you know, for plastic surgery? Well, I think you want to look at their credentials and then you have to be comfortable with the person. 
you want to look at their you know their work that they've done but you want to make sure that they're board certified where they trained that they seem like a reputable individual um and you want to feel comfortable with them and feel that you know your questions are answered yeah absolutely um and let's see i know a lot of people um you know leave the u.s to go get surgery and stuff what what are your thoughts on on that type of thing you know i mean i've taken care of a number of people who've had problems from those places um, I think you lose the ability of quality control when you go certain places. I mean, listen, there are certain countries around the world where there's excellent plastic surgeons, but I don't think that that's necessarily the people that someone who's leaving this country is going to. Um, even when you're in this country, you're not always sure what you're going to because of the way people can, you know, describe what their background is. Um, so you have to be careful. And, you know, if you go to surgery in a place and you don't have a support system or know what's going to happen, you know, if you have a complication and you're in a third world country, you're going to wind up in a third world hospital. I mean, those kind of things can snowball out of proportion and you can really get into trouble. Yeah. And, <laughs> yikes. <laughs> and just, um, you know, and I know, I know you have amazing credentials. Uh, I was reading, I know you went to NYU Medical School and Harvard and all that. Like to me, that's how I I would start there, looking at somebody's credential, their education, where they did their residency, and then I would imagine in your case that you get a lot of people who fly in specifically to come to see you and get and get some work done. Yeah, I mean, I definitely have people that do travel from you know outside the area, and you know usually those are people that are referred by you know previous patients, which is always nice um you know the best referral source is a happy patient and yeah. you know you know although it is more complicated when you take care of someone who's not from the area because remember they're going to be staying in a hotel and things like that um i do require them to stay in town for a certain period of time but depending on the procedure because i want to get out of that um you know early period where they have potential issues i mean listen you can always develop a problem three weeks later, four weeks later, but those are much less common. Most problems happen within the first week. And, you know, you don't want someone necessarily getting on the airplane, you know, running away right after they had surgery, because that can have adverse effects as well. Yeah. So even getting back to Angela's question about recovery time. So if somebody were to come out to have um, breast augmentation, how long do they need to be around in order to, um, you know, to make sure that everything's free and free and clear, so to speak? I would want someone in town for at least a week post post operatively. Okay, that's, that's I mean, I mean, if they're if they were going to drive, you know, if they lived in Philadelphia, they can go home. I mean, that that's not a big deal. But if they're going to get on a plane, then I really want them to be around for at least a week. Is there a complication with getting on a plane? By any chance, in terms of like you know the altitude or whatever, is there anything to be concerned about? Well, I, I mean, I guess there could be some pressure changes with an airplane, but there's also concerns of people being in an airplane for a long time and being immobile for a long time, just like surgery and things like blood clots and things like that. So, those are things you have to look at. You know, I probably wouldn't want someone flying in the day before a big surgery on a 10-hour flight either, because they'd be set, uh, set up for a blood clot and you might want to avoid that as well. So. Wow. That's interesting. I didn't think about that. I think Tiffany has a question. She's asking if plastic surgery hurts. <laughs> well, it is surgery and certain procedures are obviously have more discomfort than others, but whenever you have, I mean, if you cut your finger, it hurts. So, I mean, yes, we do give people pain medication to help manage the pain and certain procedures do hurt more than others. Um, you know, a tummy tuck tends to hurt more because we're tightening the muscles. A breast augmentation is usually uncomfortable for the first few days because we go below the muscle and have to cut the muscle. Breast lift might be have very little discomfort and certain areas liposuction tends to not hurt much and other areas it tends to be more sore. So, and, and obviously pain is also very different based on the individual. I mean, I have patients where I'll do the same procedure and they'll take no pain medication and be fine and other people who, you know, tell me there's a lot of pain and discomfort. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Um, I, I saw a couple of things and I don't know, I really don't hear much about it anymore, but in terms of um, 
liposuction. I saw that they were doing some liposuction where people were just standing there and I guess they had maybe local anesthesia or something and and they, yeah. they would go to work the next day, like no big deal. I mean, you can certainly go to work the next day, whether even if you have general anesthesia for liposuction. I mean, for the most part, and it depends on how much liposuction you do. If you do a 500 cc liposuction, that's one thing. If you do an eight liter liposuction, which I wouldn't recommend because the volume's too high, you should really cut it off at five liters as an outpatient. Um, you know, you're going to be, if you do eight areas, you're going to be sore. If you do one area and it's the middle of the abdomen, it's not going to hurt very much. So I, I think that you really have to figure out, you know, what you're trying to achieve and, and then be realistic in what amount of time you need off and what kind of recovery. There's another question here. Um, if somebody has um, a history of DVT, can they have plastic surgery? Is the risk of getting a blood clot higher? Um, I would say yes. If you've had a history of a DVT, you certainly have it somewhat of an increased risk. Exactly. Then you have to figure out why the person had the DVT. I mean, some people have clotting abnormalities that may have been the cause of their DVT. And if someone has a history like that, I require them to go see their the hematologist who took care of their DVT and make recommendations of what we would need to do if they were to have plastic surgery. And just so everybody knows what DVT is, can you? Uh, deep, deep vein thrombosis. It's a blood clot in the, in the deep veins of the leg. The, the problem with the DVT is that the blood clot can break off and go to your lungs, and that's called a pulmonary embolus, and that can be dangerous as well, wow. more dangerous even than the DVT. And are there, like, so what was, I can't remember her name, but there's like a reality show uh, person who's been really sick and she thinks she has Lyme disease. And I just heard this past week that one of her um, breast implants ruptured and she's been trying to figure out for the longest time. And I don't think of her name. Um, she's been trying to figure out what the problem is and trying all kinds of things. And now, you know, they're, now they're narrowing it down and thinking that maybe it was because of this, this breast implant. Like what are the ramifications if, if you have a breast implant that ruptures? Well, I mean, if you have a breast implant that's ruptured, that should certainly be removed because they do provide some inflammation to the area. Um, and, this, you know, certainly if depending on how old the implant is, silicone has been known to go to the lymph nodes and other areas. Um, there are a lot of, you know, a lot of the things that happened in the early 90s when the breast implants were removed from the market, the scientific data never showed that there was a difference in those diseases and people who had implants or didn't have implants. Um, you know, sometimes also the implant can sometimes become the scapegoat for not being able to figure out the issue. Now, I don't know, don't, don't watch any reality TV, so I don't know who you're talking about. Um, but, you know, Lyme's disease is an infection, you know, from a tick. So there are certainly symptoms that happen from that. You know, there are symptoms that could be similar to rheumatologic disorders that could be for other reasons, you know, obviously there's a lot to figure out in a person like that. So, so you don't feel that like if they rupture, basically you just have to take out the implant and you're good to go. There's no long-term well, issue. Well, one of, I mean, the implants that came back on the market 10 years ago are much more cohesive than the old ones. You can actually cut them in half, squeeze the stuff, see it come out and let go and it goes back in. So it's, it, it, it's very different than what was out on the market many, many years ago. But when you take out the implant, you want to try and take the entire capsule around the implant out in one piece so you get any free or loose silicone out and you're not leaving anything behind. Now, that's not always possible because sometimes the by the time you find out, the silicone's moved beyond that capsule anyway. And sometimes, you know, you it's just there's too much inflammation. You can't always get it out in one piece and you want to try and get every bit out you can, but you know, it's not always possible, but people frequently will have a ruptured implant, have their capsule removed and then just get another implant. Right. Yeah. I would imagine that once you've had the implants to take them out, what happens? <laughs> Where does everything go? It goes South. <laughs> so, <laughs> which is the reason you got the implant in the first place, right? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there, I mean, listen, when people have an issue with their implant, most people replace them. Um, I do occasionally have people who say, you know, listen, take them out. I don't want to deal with them anymore. But they tend to be older. 
and you know they, they just don't want to be dealing with something much later in life so they decide that I've, I've reached a point where i really don't care if um if i have this implanted any not anymore or not and if someone has you know very very large boobs naturally and they're kind of sagging a little bit and they want to do an um i don't know what the term is but for the reduction um do they need implants after the reduction no i mean uh, when you do a reduction you do a you know a, there is a lifting portion of the of the reduction the nipples move to the appropriate location and depending on the technique uh, and one of them was a paper that uh, you know i wrote and published uh, in 2005 was a technique that actually kept the breasts up without a lot of sagging after a breast reduction, even for larger ones. And I mean, obviously the people never sag like they were before when they were really big, but there'll be a little bit of sagging over time because there's still gravity affecting it, but you can get it, but put it, taking out to then put an implant in for the most part makes things very complicated. If you start to have two variables when you're solving a problem rather than one. Oh, okay. Okay. I wasn't sure about that. I was, you know, for some reason I thought I had heard that that was like the automatic procedure, um, that you would get the reduction and then an implant. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> no, I, to be honest with you, I, not something I've had to do on maybe more than one occasion. And that, that was some kind of special problem that the person had with their breast that was more abnormal than, than, than just a straight breast reduction. Are there any other um, procedures that you know that you're you want to go over tonight, just so people have a complete understanding of the various procedures out there that might be of interest? Anything that's new and exciting <laughs> that's popular right now? Well, I mean, we talked about the uh, you know Brazilian butt lift, but we didn't really talked too much about a tummy tuck, even which is obviously an integral part of the mommy makeover, and, and there's several parts to that. Um, you know we need to remove the extra skin we and we need to tighten the muscle because the muscle has been stretched from pregnancies um back in uh the late 1990s i started doing liposuction as part of the tummy tuck including the upper abdomen because when you if you didn't do that i felt that when you tighten the muscles you create a little bunching in the upper abdomen and up to that point people had said you had to do this as two stages you know you do the tummy tuck first then you come back and liposuction the abdomen and I proved that you could do it in one stage safely. And, you know, now that's become pretty commonplace where people are doing liposuction as an integral part of the tummy tuck, you know, and that is, you know, most people when they're having a mommy makeover, that's kind of like the baseline procedure that you start with. You uh, then do add ons to that. So when you do a, um, a tummy tuck, do you kind of redo the, the belly button and like have to what, kind of what you do is you you make an incision around the belly button and the belly button stays attached to the to the muscle underneath when you then get rid of the skin you then pull the skin down and you make a new hole and bring out the belly button uh, so your belly button brought out through different skin okay that's going to be my first procedure with you i think my <laughs> my tummy tuck with liposuction angela i don't understand your question it says here how often does it have to be done I think she's referring to cool sculpting. Oh, cool sculpting. I've never heard of that. You know, cool sculpting is freezing of the fat. And this was actually developed you know, in Boston. What happened was they noticed that kids who would put ice pops in their mouth would get a hollow cheek because the ice pop was so cold, it would kill some of the fat in the cheek, and then they'd get a hollowing. So they developed a procedure where what ha will happen is fat will die at a certain temperature above where the skin gets damaged. So you find a place between the, where the skin, fat dies and where the skin gets damaged. You cool the area to that. You kill some of the fat cells and then the body takes care of those over a couple of months. It is effective. I haven't have the oh, full disclosure. I have a machine in my office. It, um, it, it will reduce the fat in an area by about 20 to 25 percent of what you're treating and there are different uh, pieces that can treat the abdomen the flanks the arms things like that one of the, you know what happens is the company tends to recommend multiple treatments which obviously increases the cost if you're doing something a couple of times um, i've had patients who have been perfectly happy with one treatment i've had other patients who've had two or three treatments to get 
an additional 20% off. It is used to treat limited areas of fat. You can't take someone who has, you know, a large belly. I mean, I guess you could, but you know, you'd be putting the device on for a really long time and you probably would spend a lot more money than just having liposuction. So, and it's not, and it's not painful. It's uncomfortable for the first few minutes when the fat gets sucked in between these two cold plates because mm -hmm. there's two cold plates and a vacuum pulls the fat and skin in. So until it gets cold, it's uncomfortable. Once it gets cold, the area is kind of numb. But each time you put the device on, it's on for an hour. So if you're doing multiple areas, you could be there, you know, for five or six hours in a day. Wow. And Tiffany was asking a question about what about the face? Um, you talk, um, Tiffany, if you want to clarify that question, uh, is it? Are you asking about um, face lifts and things like that? And if you want to just pop in a yes in the chat box, that, that will help clarify it. Um, if, she's, if she's talking about cool sculpting for the uh, for the face, the there's a device for the for this area on the neck that just was approved a few months ago um you know that's the only thing in terms of cool sculpting for the face there's nothing on the face per se otherwise and and angela wants to know um how long does the result last on that well once the fat is dead it gets eliminated over two to three months and just like liposuction those fat cells are gone so unless you do something to make your fat cells bigger again the area is gone it's a it's a one-time thing unless you want to get more result you just do it again so can you give us some ideas of uh like price ranges and and things like that like for example um you know what's what's the average cost for uh, price you know range wise for um a tummy tuck I mean, I guess a tummy tuck when you, if you're just doing a tummy tuck with the operating room and anesthesia, you're probably talking nine, ten thousand dollars. Okay. And then, so like, let's say you couple that, you know, with the breast augmentation and I don't know what else people would do, a little liposuction, you know, like. I mean, you're going to start to get up to around 20,000. And then if you're doing that augmentation and a lift, it gets, you know, the more you add, the more expensive it gets so and obviously we usually the office will you know discount second and third procedures somewhat um and also the first hour of the operating room is always the most expensive so if you're doing multiple things that it would be cheaper to do them together rather than separately okay and i think angela was asking if the cool sculpting versus the liposuction are you, are you talking about cost or effectiveness or what the doctor recommends on that well, I would tell you that liposuction can do more than cool sculpting treatment for treatment. Um, you know, I think a lot of the reason some people want cool sculpting is they just are adamantly opposed to having any surgery at all. So you come into the office, you sit there, you have the, the device put on, you spend a few hours there and you get some result, which it, and certainly We've shown patients before and after pictures of themselves and they've been happy with the result, but it's not the same as doing liposuction. Yeah, and I'm sorry, T, is cool sculpting safer than lipo? Well, I mean, there's really not been any problems reported with cool sculpting. Uh, there's no frostbite. Um, you know, it's more limited in its effectiveness but it's not a surgical procedure. So, you know, you are giving up, you know, you do have a potential for, for complications with any surgical procedure or any anesthetic. So you are, you do have those risks. They're all very, very small, but you're giving that up to have less effective procedure. Okay. And um, I don't know if we had another question in here. Uh, let's see. Okay. Um, so, no, this has been really, really enlightening. And, of course, you know, you and I will be meeting at some point <laughs> for my session. Um, but I wanted to to thank you so much for coming tonight and going over all this information because I it's really interesting and good stuff for people to know in case they want to do something 
you know, at least they understand how it works and, and kind of get, uh, you know, just a way better understanding than just kind of hearing what you hear out there from other people. Um, if anybody wants to get a hold of Dr. Abramson, I have put his URL in there um, so that you can go ahead and uh, go to his, um, his website. And I will tell you, Dr. Abramson has an amazing resume, highly regarded, highly respected New York, New Jersey plastic surgeon, board certified. And um, I would definitely recommend if you're going to have some kind of procedure that you definitely check him out. And I will be doing that myself because I'm going to be 50 next year. And that's my 50th birthday for myself is <laughs> uh, a little, a little nip tuck here and there. Um, you know, I think it's going to feel good, but if anybody has any questions, oh, Angela's good. We're going to go and try to get a two for one. And <laughs> if, um, if anyone has any questions, by all means, reach out to Dr. Abramson or, Contact us at avconnections.com, and we can forward you uh, information to uh, get a hold of him. And um, this was really awesome. Thank you so much. And just want to okay. also mention that that Dr. Abramson is part of the, uh, along with me, with the Divorce Professionals, which is a group that um, you know really supports people who are going through that process. We're not lawyers, and we don't encourage anybody to get a divorce. But sometimes people make that decision and, you know, we have a group of professionals that will uh, help support you through that process. So um, you can look us up at thedivorceprofessionals.com and I will put that in here. And uh, Dr. Abramson, if there's anything else you'd like to share? No, I think that's it. Thank you. I'm glad I was able to come on and uh, provide some information for your uh, audience. Thank you so much. And uh, I hope you guys will uh, join us again uh, two weeks from now because we have the holidays coming up. So in two weeks, we will start our blabs back up at eight o'clock on Wednesdays. Uh, and we should have some, we actually have a great lineup, uh, you know, of uh, speakers that are coming on board. So please, please do join us or check us out at avconnections.com or on uh, girltalkingcocktails.com and you'll see who's lined up to be on the next um, uh, segments. But thank you again, Dr. Abramson, and good night, everyone. Have a wonderful holiday, and uh, we'll see you at the next Girl Talking Cocktails. Good night. Good night.